So this is episode one of Obadiah, an introduction to the Edomites. So here's Obadiah, here's the, the United Kingdom under David and Solomon, and then under Solomon's son it breaks up into Israel and Judah, and God sends a multitude of prophets to warn these two kingdoms, Israel and Judah, of their misdoings and how they will be judged. So Obadiah was active around 845 BC over here, and most prophets preached only to the two Jewish nations, Judah and Israel, and to warn them of their coming judgments. But some also prophesied to foreign nations, like Jonah, who prophesied to the Assyrian capital Nineveh, and Obadiah, this book, who prophesied to Edom, and warning them of the impending disasters for their hostility and treatment of the Israelites, God's people. So this is the format of the book of Obadiah. Verses 1 to 14 is the accusations against Edom themselves. And verse 15 says, but hang on, we're against, God is against all nations. And so verses 16 to 21 is the day of the Lord for all nations. And here's this, this uh, animated overview is really great. So let's dive into an introduction to the Edomites. Two nations in her womb. So let's have a look at Adam's family tree here. Uh, his father, Terah, here, Abraham, his sister, the different mother, same father, so she's a half-sister. Uh, Nahor and Haran were the four brothers. Haran, of course, gave birth to Lot, his son, who was the nephew then of Abraham, and, and Lot's uh, daughters slept with their father and got the Moabites and the Ammonite tribes. But we don't care about them for, for Obadiah. Here's Abraham, they get married, they have Isaac, and Isaac and Rebekah get married, and they ha she has the twins Esau and Jacob. And Jacob becomes the father of the 12 patriarchs, and daughter Dinah, and Esau becomes the father of the Edomite tribe. So this is how they come down from Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, and to Edom. So two nations in a womb. So the hatred of the Edomites for Israel started in the womb and continues to drive world events even today. So Abraham's wife Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah who gave birth to the twins Jacob and Esau. And Jacob became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel while Esau became the father of the Edomites. Thus the Edomites had a shared ancestry with the Israelites. They both belonged to the bloodline of Abraham. And these two families or tribes continued to struggle just as they had in the womb. So this is the story in Genesis 25. But the children struggled together within her in her womb. And she, Rebecca, said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. And God prophesied, one people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. So God's telling you already what's going on. So when her days were fulfilled, for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And Genesis continues, And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterwards his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew. And Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac, their father, loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah, their mother, loved Jacob. So the word play on Esau, the name Esau means to do or make. There's a word play here to describe the firstborn twin because the Hebrew for Edom is exactly the same word for Adam, meaning humanity. Additionally, the Hebrew word for red, like Esau's hair color, is related to the word Edom. So furthermore, Heri is similar to Seir, the name of the place where Esau had lived and the land occupied by his descendants. The name Seir was probably the first name known for the land of Edom. It was originally called that. So Esau had already occupied Seir or Edom when Jacob returned from Haran, where he had run to escape Esau's wrath. So Genesis 32, then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So lots of wordplay here within the Hebrew, Esau and Edom and the redhead and the arch rival of Israel. Wordplay on Jacob, the, na the name Jacob means may God protect. And Jacob can also mean to follow after or to be behind. The word heel is Achib and Jacob came out from the womb clutching Esau's heel. And the word Achob 
means deceitful or sly. So Jacob's name suggests the one who grabs the heel or the one who trips up. Nevertheless, as we shall see, Jacob was in God's anointed line. Malachi 1, Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Very different brothers. So Esau sells his birthright. Jacob started fighting with Esau while still in the womb, as the twins wrestled to exit the womb as the firstborn. Esau won and was thus in line for the firstborn birthright and its associated blessing. Even in the womb, Jacob was fighting to be firstborn and seized his brother by the heel to prevent his birth. Jacob can also mean to supplant or to overreach. After being born second, Jacob did not give up. From the womb, he was determined to get God's anointing. And so the twins grew, and while Esau was out hunting, Jacob stayed near the tents and took responsibility for the family. Story continues in Genesis. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die, so what's the birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentil. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In other words, didn't regard it highly. So the birthright is a very precious gift given by the parent to the firstborn to formally acknowledge him as the principal heir. Under the patriarchal order, the right or inheritance of the firstborn birthright generally included a land inheritance as well as the authority to preside over family matters. In addition, the bestowal of the birthright had two conditions. So one condition being the worthiness of the recipient and the other was simply the choice of the Lord. So now I had this whole big write-up in here for a page or two, and then I found this guy, and his was, he said it so much better than I did, so I just copied his. So this is from discoverhubpages.com, blah, blah, blah. So it's in blue because I wanted you to see that this was written by somebody else. So Esau's unconcern for his birthright is further shown by his choice of wives. The requirement of the Lord was given much earlier in the scriptures that the birthright blessing were to be given to the one who was married within the covenant line. Esau disregards this requirement and marries two Hittite women. This action causes him to become a grief of mind to his parents, Isaac and Rebekah. By his own actions, he has forfeited the right to the birthright blessing, and Jacob literally becomes Esau as the rightful birthright holder. This is important to remember, for when his father asks Jacob if he is the son Esau, he responds in the affirmative, I am Esau. As far as the birthright goes, he is. So the birthright was honored by God as a holy covenant, yet Esau willingly and knowingly sold his birthright for a one-time pot of soup. He didn't even say, you've got to sell me soup for a month. It was He sold it for a one-time pot of soup, which was a legitimate, legal transaction. He sold it. Esau lived for the present, for his immediate physical gratification, and he lost his future because of that. And with the birthright, Jacob automatically got the blessing. The birthright, which was the land inheritance, etc., and the blessing were one and the same thing. You couldn't separate them. If you got the one, you got the other. So continuing at this website, as Isaac becomes old and ready to pass the birthright blessing to his son, he calls Esau in and specifically gives him instructions concerning a righteous offering. It's important to understand that the people of the time were living under the laws of blood sacrifice instituted with Adam and Eve. Isaac is requiring his son to make a sacrifice so that he may bless him. Now remember, Rebecca was given inspiration as to who the rightful blessing holder should be long before the boys were even born. So she takes it upon herself to make sure the prophecy is fulfilled. Remember up at the top in Genesis it said that God told her that the older would serve the younger. So she calls Jacob to her and tells him to go and make a sacrifice, in other words, catch something and kill it, to the father so she, uh, that she will prepare for him so that he may receive the promised blessing. The added insight to the story is given when one considers the type of sacrifice Rebecca prepares. She instructs Jacob to go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids 
of the goats. In the book of Leviticus, we are given the definition of this type of sacrifice in chapter 16, part of which says, And Aaron the priest shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Rebecca is literally making an offer of one son so that the other will have a chance to make atonement through repentance and obedience to the Lord, which Esau never does do. So thus Jacob becomes the offering and Esau becomes the scapegoat. Jacob is known as the supplanter, which means to replace one thing by something else. Likewise, Jesus has become our supplanter of our sins. This to me is an awesome symbol for the role Christ plays for all of us. We, being unworthy to merit the birthright blessing on our own, have the opportunity to partake of the blessing through Jesus. There are many more wonderful symbolic meanings that apply to the additional story that takes place when the actual blessings of Jacob occurs. But for me, the most important evidence has already been laid. By simply understanding the type of sacrifice that was offered, we can conclude that both Isaac and Rebekah knew the mind and will of the Lord and followed it. As Jacob explains to Isaac when questioned how he acquired the means for the sacrifice so quickly, because he just went to the things and and grabbed a goat, whereas Esau went out hunting. So when Isaac inquires how he got it so quickly, Jacob says, because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Jacob was certainly the Lord's choice, and nobody was fooled or tricked. I think all involved understood far better than we observe, than we the observer. So We've always thought that, you know, Isaac couldn't really see because he had bad eyesight, etc. But this person is saying because of the sacrifice that was chosen, um, one as the, the lot, one for God and one for um, a scapegoat, Isaac wasn't fooled as to who was getting the actual blessing. So back to me now. As Christians. Since we are taught Jacob was a deceiver and lived a life of lies, deception, and manipulation. In the Middle East, if they say about a person you grab at his heel, that's a figurative way to accuse someone of being a deceiver. But the Hebrew teachings have an entirely different slant on Jacob. He is seen as a fighter, one who just never gives up. And because Jacob got the deathbed blessing from his father Isaac, he was therefore in God's anointed line. Only through repentance did he finally receive the full blessing of God when he wrestled with an angel of God all night. He sought favor to honor God and would not give up until he got the blessing. And Jacob's desire to honor God pleased the Lord and he blessed Jacob. In rebellion, because he lost the blessing, Esau married pagan women. And he goes down in history as the foundation of the tribe of Edom that God later swore to destroy King Herod and his ilk with the last of the Edomites. In contrast, Jacob obediently marries Hebrews and goes down in history as the father and foundation of the 12 tribes of Israel, that blessed Jewish nation. Thus, due to his unceasing efforts, ultimately Jacob grew to be greater than Esau. God decides who will be in his anointed line. God raises up kings and brings kingdoms down. And Esau was not his choice. And since that time, the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, always aligned themselves against the Israelites and had a maniacal hatred of all things Jewish. So, where is Edom? So, let's go through the map quickly first. So, Edom was here to the south. Here's Jerusalem, Hebron, and Edom was to the south here from the valley of Aquabah. This away. And uh, this was the King's Highway. So here we have from Egypt to here, uh, the King's Highway. And we had this other, the way of the Philistines. So Eden was an ancient land in Transjordan. Here's the Jordan River here. South of Moab, which was over here, and west of the Arabah, which is this valley, uh, with the Arabian deserts to its south and east. Our knowledge of Eden comes mostly from the Bible. But its boundaries were never firmly fixed and moved over time, depending on local skirmishes. This expanding and contracting of borders was a normal state of affairs for ancient times. There were two main trade routes, one along the Mediterranean coast, called the Way of the Sea, as you can see, or the Way of the Philistines, because it went through the land of the Philistines. The other trade route, the King's Highway, ran through Edom. So this is the part that that Moses took out of Egypt. 
They brought them down through the Sinai Peninsula and up to Kadesh, uh, to Kadesh Barnea, um, where he sent the 12 spies into the land of Canaan. And then because they wouldn't go and fight, God made them wander around the wilderness here for 40 years. And after that, when God said, okay, you can go ahead now, um, Moses asked Edom, because now the Edomites control this whole region, he asked the king of Edom if they could just cut across the top and up to the Jordan River. And the king of Edom said no. So they were forced to go from here all the way down here to the port of the Elath and all the way up through the mountains. So they had to go on the king's highway. Edom had two main cities, Bozra, designated the capital city, and Selah, today called Petra, was the principal stronghold. So back in the day, the kings chose which city would be their capital based on that king's pre preferences. But mostly they chose Basra, but you didn't have to. They didn't have to choose that as their capital. So Edom's economic wealth came from the fact that the king's highway was a strategic east-west trade route and had access to the port city Elat on the Gulf of Arabah. The region also had rich copper mines and were renowned for their copper production. So if you wanted to go trade north-south, you went up the, the, the way of the Philistines. If you wanted to go east-west in, inland like that, you went on the king's highway. So it's a very strategically placed uh, region. So within the city of Petra is the huge Mount Seir, and the prophecy of Obadiah is all about that mountain. This is Petra. Everybody knows Petra. The Edomites lived in caves carved in the mountain and also on top of Mount Seir, where they offered human sacrifices to their gods. They felt unassailable on their lofty perch. Eden's pride in themselves meant, on the flip side, that they felt contempt for everyone else, especially Israel. God hates pride. Just ask Satan how that worked out for him. So Eden's pride in the impregnable mountain led to their fall. Eden smugly said, God himself couldn't bring them down. So God did. God dislodged them and their city was sacked. There's that story of the pastor that got on the Titanic and when he closed the, the door to his cabin on the back was a sign saying, not even God can sink the ship. <laughs> so he packed up his bag and he got off. Lucky for him. So the Edomite said, not even God can bring us down. So God did. So man loves being up high. As kids, when we played battles, we would run up the sand pile and sing out, I'm the king of the castle and you're the dirty rascal. And the battle would ensue in earnest. Man and kids. Love being up high on top of mountains. Edom was an ancient kingdom, and the Bible lists the kings of Edom before any Israelite king reigned. If the list of kings is taken at face value, then it appears that the kingship of ancient Edom was not hereditary, but perhaps elective. So as an aside, during World War I, Lawrence of Arabia operated along the King's Highway, attacking trains along the Hajjaz Railway and blowing up 79 bridges. Another interesting fact is that when Lawrence had a fatal bike accident 200 yards from his cottage in England, the doctor who tried to save him was so horrified at Lawrence's head injuries that he went home and designed the bike helmet that we all wear today, albeit modified over time. So here's the King's Highway, and this is where... Lawrence of Arabia operated. I always thought it was way in the desert, but it wasn't. It was here in the, on the King's Highway. So if you've been with me for any length of time, you know I love my maps. I like to see where things are. So here's Judah. This is where uh, the, the Negev, where uh, Moses and them trotted around. And now Moses asked the king of Edom if he could cross across here. The de here's the Dead Sea, the River Jordan, and then the... The Sea of Galilee would be higher. And he asked if he could cross up here and go up on the Transjordan side. And the king of Edom said no. So this is what Moses had to do. He had to come down through these mountains, through this. Now remember, these mountains are, Mount Seir is 3,600 feet or 2,200 meters above, above the valley. So they had to come down and then go down this mountain, down to Elat, and then up this 4,000-foot mountain, to the top, to the King's Highway, and across like that. So the, the detour was quite taxing. And so God was angry at Edom for forcing his people to go all the way around when they could have just hopped across there. So the everlasting hatred. Hundreds of years after Jacob got Esau's blessing, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. After wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, 
Moses asked the king of the Edomites if they could traverse his land, which, which would have been across here. But he refused. The king even sent an army to waylay Moses. So Moses and the Israelites had to travel all the way around the kingdom of Eden rather than the shortcut across the top. God had ordered the Israelites to make the detour rather than wage war with their brother. But God was angry with Edom and swore venge vengeance. So later, as Joshua was dividing the promised land between the 12 tribes, he allotted Judah up to the borders of Edom, but did not encroach on their lands because they still respected the fact that they were brothers, even though Edom hated uh, Jacob or Israel. Uh, so two centuries later, King Saul is fighting the Edomites, who were considered an enemy of Israel, and finally David conquered Edom. He put military garrisons throughout their land, made them a vassal state, and they had to pay taxes, and set an Israelite governor over them. So during King Jehoshaphat's reign in Judah, the Edomites joined the Ammonites and Moabites. So here's Edom, here's the Moabites, here are the Ammonites. And remember, they were uh, from the daughters of Lot who slept with their father after Sodom and Gomorrah were flattened. So uh, the Edomites joined the Ammonites and Moabites in a raid on Judah, but with God's help, the three allies instead destroyed one another. So war between the Edomites and Israel continued almost unabated for many generations of kings. Eventually, the Edomites utterly betrayed their bloodline cousins during the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 586 BC when the Edomites took sides against Judah. They cheered on the Babylonians as they plundered and burned Jerusalem, God's city. Raise it, raise it, they called, encouraging the Babylonians to destroy the city to its foundations. Dash their little children against the stones and wipe out the Jews, they yelled. They even blocked the escape of those fleeing the burning city so that all Judah was rounded up and taken into captivity in Babylon. For centuries, if any national tribe went to war against Israel, the Edomites joined the aggressors. As a nation, they weren't strong enough by themselves to tackle Israel, so they gleefully joined those who were stronger. The Edomites didn't just stand by and cheer on the raiding parties. They physically joined in the battles against Israel. And all their hatred, jealousy, and resentment of centuries repeatedly bubbled over into wars against God chosen. So the word here says, Hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah, with your hands contend for him. So the resentment of centuries repeatedly bubbled over against God's chosen. Since the Edomites shared a common bloodline, their hostility is all the more reprehensible. Edom was fully responsible for her open aggression and for failing to support Israel in her hours of need. And God held Edom accountable for their violence and the betrayal of their brotherly bond. This continued hatred of the Edomites for the Israelites hundreds of years after their forefather Esau willingly gave up his birthright, angered God, and he determined to wipe them all out. So the judgment against the Edomites is mentioned in more Old Testament books than it is against any other. Look at this, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Malachi. All of these books. Obadiah warned the Edomites they would face God's judgment. But the Edomites ignored all the prophecies because in ancient times, all nations had their own set of gods. And why pay any attention to the God of Israel? But they should have. Why? Because there's only one God, and he is the God of all nations. It's God who raises kings and brings down kingdoms. It's God who draws the map. And God judges nations by their attitude to his people. Whoever harms Israel is in direct conflict with Almighty God. Not a smart place to be. Genesis 12, God said to Abram, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in Numbers 24, belongs reluctant prophecy. Blessed is he who blesses you, Israel, and cursed is he who curses you. What we do to God's chosen is what we do to God. They are the apple of his eye. And what we do to Christians is what we do to Jesus, the Messiah. Years ago, a prophecy came out about America and Israel. God said, if America forces Israel to accept a two-party state, then God in anger will split America in two down the Mississippi River. And the two riverbanks will be split miles apart. Can you imagine the 
awful economic consequences on America if that happened. Hundreds of bridges would come down. The two, the two sides of America would be split by miles. Maybe the river will become un, unnavigable. They won't be able to sail it like they do now, moving goods up and down. Such devastating consequences if America forces Israel to accept a two-party state. And remember, you don't want to do that. So the Edomite migration. At this time, the Greek Empire ruled the known world. And because Judah was taken into captivity to Babylon, their land basically lay vacant. And it was a good land, running with milk and honey. So in the 4th century BC, when the nomadic Nabataeans waged war on Edom, the fleeing Edomites moved westward into southern Judah and occupied it. And they called the country Edomea, which was the Greek term for the Edomites because the Greek empire was there, running under Alexander the Great. And they made Hebron, just here's Jerusalem, here's Hebron, just 19 miles south of Jerusalem, they made it their capital. And Hebron is about 3,400 feet above sea level. And unlike Jerusalem, the city was left intact by the Babylonians. Hebron remained under Edomite control until Judas Maccabeus, in an uprising, retook the city under Jewish control in 164 BC, and 38 years later, the Jewish army reconquered Hebron. So the Edomians in Hebron were forced to die, or flee, or be converted to, to, to Judaism. That's never a good idea to force conversion on people. That's what Constantinople did with the pagans, and they forced them to become Christians, and now look at us. So now the Greek Empire was declining and the Roman Empire ruled the world. So here's the Roman Empire all around the Mediterranean Sea, from Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Greece, all the way through Turkey, and there's itty bitty little Judah over here, Israel, the Nile, Egypt, and all the African countries. So the Greek Empire was declining and the Roman Empire ruled the known world. So the Jews that emerged from the Greek Empire maintained the independence for a few decades but then were subjugated by the Roman Empire of Jesus' day. Now the Romans were faced with this co-mingled group of Jews and Idumeans, or fake Jews as Jesus called them, of the synagogue of Satan. However, to the Roman mind, the Idumeans were simply an offshoot of Judaism, and they considered any tension between the Jews and the Idumeans as simply a family squabble. In 47 BC, he made the Idumean governor over Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, basically the whole of Israel. At the same time, the boundaries of Idumea shrank and occupied the lands of the Amalekites and lost their lands east of the Dead Sea. So now Idumea is just squished into this little area down here. So in 37 BC, this is before Jesus was born, an Edomite petitioned Rome to buy the royal crown of Israel. So Caesar sold him the crown, and the Romans named Herod son of Antipater, as king over Israel. He seemed Jewish to the Roman mind, but Herod the Great was hostile to the real Jews, and the Jewish people loathed their bought and paid for Edomite overlord. Now for the first time in Israel's history, an Edomian, an Edomite, King Herod was king of the Jews, but he was not a Jew. An Edomite ruled Israel. The Herod dynasty of the New Testament were all Edomites, and Herod the Great, at the time of Jesus' birth, certainly didn't want to hear from the three wise men that the real king of the Jews had been born. So he slaughtered every Jewish baby under two years old, hoping to kill the true Jewish king. But he failed to murder the Messiah. Matthew 2 tells us, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, because the wise men screwed it out without coming back to him, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he ascertained from the wise men. Jesus himself was forced to stand on trial before Herod, an Edomite king, and be judged by him. Herod's son, Herod Antipas, murdered Jesus' cousin John the Baptist and even sat in judgment at one of Jesus' trials. Antipas was a lustful man living only in the presence to the extent that he promised half his kingdom to a dancing girl. That's the Esau syndrome, living only for the present, giving no thought to the future. Like Esau, selling his birthright for a quick pot of soup, Antipas, blithely promising half his kingdom, 
also gave no thought to the future. Instead, on the advice of her mother, the dancing girl chose the head of John the Baptist on a plate, and Herod gave it to her. Herod's grandson, Herod Agrippa I, harassed the new church and killed James, the brother of Apostle John, with a sword. And later, for his enjoyment of eating pigs, he was eaten by worms in the book of Acts. And Herod's great-grandson, Herod Agrippa II, died in the year 100 AD without children. And the ethnic Edomite nation disappears from history. One thing we know is that God is a patient God. He takes his time before judging a nation. He gives them ample opportunities to repent. Jacob and Esau lived around 1800 BC, and Herod Agrippa died 100 AD. So God took nearly 2,000 years before he brought absolute and final judgment to the line of Esau, the Edomites. And Obadiah saw it all in a vision and said it would happen. And from Obadiah until 100 AD, when Agrippa II died, was 900 years. So from his prophecy to the death of the final Edomite was 900 years. So God's a patient God. And God is a holy God. And a holy God judges sin. The mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly small. So the Roman Empire maps. At the time of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, there was civil unrest among the Zealots, the Edomans, and the Orthodox Jews. 20,000 Edoman infantry slaughtered many of the Orthodox Jews. Others fought with the Jews against the Romans, and many Edomans were killed, sold into slavery, or were part of the 40,000 that Caesar set free. So let's have a quick look at the map. We have the Kingdom of Herod the Great, which is this green section. We have uh, the Decapolis. We have the Free City, so the Philistines. They were always regarded as separate as these giants. They were, uh, they had the little free city, and of course their cities and towns scattered throughout. So this is the region that uh, Herod the Great managed. So from 132 to 136 AD, the revolt led by Simon Bar Kokhba was a large-scale armed rebellion initiated by the Jews of Judea against the Roman Empire. It was the third and final escalation of the Jewish-Roman wars and nearly 600,000 lost their lives as the Romans reconquered the land. Roman maps up to 135 AD showed the region as Idumea. At this point, the Roman Emperor Hadrian was exasperated and decided to block out all Jewish nationalism entirely. Traditions like circumcision, reading the Torah, and observing the Sabbath were forbidden under penalty of death. The Romans also decided to rename the Promised Land to further obliterate Jewishness. The Jews had two primary enemies, the Philistines, the giants in this little spot here, and the Edomites. To the Roman mind, the Edomans were not as great an enemy of the Jews as were the Philistines, so they renamed the region Palestina, the Latin name for Philistine, who they perceived to be the greater enemy. So when the Greeks were in control, they renamed the land of Edom to Edomea, which was the Greek word, and now that the Romans are in control, they renamed to Palestina, which is the Latin word for this region. So Palestina was the name the Romans invented to represent Israel. And Roman maps after 135 AD showed this region as Palestina, and the region Edomea disappeared from future maps and from history. So that was the end of the Edomites. There is more judgment pronounced against Edom than any other nation. God himself declares that he will pronounce judgment against them. Isaiah 34, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment. Joel 3, Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness because of violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in their land. Malachi 1, thus says the Lord God of hosts, they, Edom, may build, but I will throw it down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. And of course, the entire book of Obadiah is only about the judgment of Edom. So look what happens to you when you <laughs> disobey God. Here's Abraham and his wife, Sarah. She gave birth to Isaac, who gave birth, well, they wasted to Esau and Jacob. So Jacob becomes the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. But 
when God told Abraham he would get a son and heir, Abraham sort of snorted and slept with the Egyptian handmaid, Sarah's Egyptian handmaiden. And she gave birth to Ishmael, which gave birth to all these Arabs. And then later on, Abraham took another wife, Keturah, who gave birth to all of these Arab nations. So because he, Abraham disobeyed God and slept with a handmaid and he got all these nations, and Isaac had these two, and Esau disobeyed God, he becomes part of these. So by disobeying God, you can certainly mess up your future, huh? Okay. So this is the end of episode one, an introduction to the Edomites. We covered two nations in a womb, the word play on Esau and Jacob. Esau sells his birthright. Whereabout is Edom in a map? Their everlasting hatred between the two nations, the Edomite migration into Edomia, and the Roman Empire maps. Imagine if God said this about you, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. A terrifying statement to, to hear. So before you go, please join me on episode two. And before you go, let me bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. God bless you. Shalom. See you in episode two.